Our next speaker is Jennifer Case. Jennifer is a founder and chief executive officer of New Leaf Biofuel, a San Diego biorefinery that converts discarded French fry oil to biodiesel. She is also on the board of directors for several industry trade association groups and spends much of her time lobbying on her industry's behalf in Sacramento and Washington, D.C. Jennifer has an undergraduate degree from University of California, San Diego, and a law degree from Pepperdine University. Her talk today is titled, The Fine Line Between Failure and Success, Life Lessons from an Accidental Entrepreneur. Let's give a warm welcome to Jennifer Case. Thank you. Today I'm going to talk about this line, the line between failure and success. I'd been having a recurring dream where I realized on the morning of the final exam that I'd somehow just forgotten to go to class all semester. And I wake up and my heart is racing. It's a ridiculous dream. I mean, who forgets to go to class all semester? But I found out that it's a very common dream related to an even more common fear, the fear of failure. It's called atikophobia. And as a lifelong atikophobe, <laughs> I've spent a lot of time talking about and thinking about failure and what it really means to be successful. And what I've discovered is that this line between failure and success, it's really thin. For a long time, I trapped myself on the wrong side of this line because I misunderstood what the true meaning of success really was. And I allowed that fear of failure to control my behavior. And when I came to terms with those things, I learned that what side of this line I'm on is all a matter of my own perspective. When I was young, I believed that to be successful, to have that feeling of personal accomplishment, it could, it could pretty much only come from being rich. My mom was a teacher, but she took time off when I was young to help my dad make partner at his accounting firm. I'll never forget the day that he left. It was the morning after our 4th of July barbecue at the country club. And they walked in the room, and I was instantly terrified. The look on my mom's face was sheer devastation. I had never seen anything like it. She was sobbing, begging him not to leave, head in his lap. The love of her life, the sole breadwinner, was leaving her alone with three kids, and she didn't have a job. I made a decision right then and there. When I grew up, I would never put myself in an emotionally or financially vulnerable position that I witnessed with my mom that day. I would be successful on my own. And I was going to be tough as nails. It was right around then where I started repeating this mantra to myself. Failure is not an option. Failure is not an option. But I would suffer a number of failures before I achieved any success at all. I was devastated when I had to drop out of medical school or pre-med in undergrad because I couldn't pass college level chemistry. I was fired, but by, not, not by one, but two different employers when I was in college. I got married way too young. <laughs> and I had to get divorced. And if I tell you anymore, I'm probably going to run into that red wall, so I'll just stop right there. But I tr trust me, there were more. Eventually, though, I found myself a lawyer. And I was working in a swanky downtown LA law firm, crisp modern furniture and floor-to-ceiling windows. And I was on the partnership track. Objectively, I had made it. But I didn't feel that way. I would set a financial goal for success. I'd say, I'm going to make $125,000 this year. 
and then I would make it. But you know what? I'm really going to feel successful when I make $150,000 per year. Do you ever notice yourself doing that? Moving your measurement stick for success? I learned a very important lesson. By constantly redefining the meaning of success whenever I achieved a goal, I was trapped on the wrong side of the line. Success was always just out of reach. And I would walk into court. I was so nervous, I thought I was going to puke. Combine the anxiety of being a novice with the agony of public speaking, and everything is on the record. <laughs> but I was getting really good at that tough as nails thing. So I would walk into court, stand behind the podium, and give my arguments. And nobody knew that behind the podium, I was shaking like a leaf. Still am. <laughs> but back at the office, I wasn't fooling anybody. And I certainly wasn't making any friends. I am really embarrassed to say that in the five years that I was an attorney, I went through five different assistants. I was so concerned about people viewing me as weak that I came off as arrogant, bossy, and cold. So objectively, I had made it. But personally, I was feeling very unfulfilled. And then out of the blue, I got a phone call from a friend of mine who had an idea for a business, and she wanted my help. We were going to collect used French fry oil from restaurants and turn it into biodiesel, saving the planet one French fry at a time. <laughs> How could I say no? So I did something that I had never done before. I took a big risk, followed my gut, deferred my student loans, moved to San Diego, and started working for sweat equity. And the biodiesel industry, well, it's pretty much like riding a roller coaster. First of all, we're the commodity business, up, down, up, down. Second of all, we are heavily reliant on government tax incentives that come and go with congressional whims, up, down, up, down. But I didn't care about any of that at the time. To anybody that would listen, do you realize that biodiesel has 80% less petroleum or 80% less emissions than petroleum diesel? And it's made right here in the United States. And yes, you're exhaust. It's going to smell like French fries. <laughs> Except that last part's not precisely true, but people really like it. So I leave that in. <laughs> I would wake up in the middle of the night and my heart was racing. But this time, it wasn't that dream. This time, it was because I had an idea for the business, and I had to write it down immediately. And I learned another very important lesson. It didn't matter to me that my credit cards were maxed, and I was eating top ramen for dinner. I had found my passion. And in doing that, I saw my first glimpse of what it meant to feel truly successful. But I had another major lesson to learn. It was four years after we collected our first gallon of cooking oil when we finally had turned a profit. And then the biodiesel tax incentive expired. And suddenly, we couldn't sell biodiesel at a competitive rate to petroleum diesel. And our company was in trouble. I remember the day that we had to announce a company-wide pay cut, and I stood up there in front of everybody, and I said, we're going to be OK. We're going to get through this. Stick with us. And then I walked into my office, and I put my head down on my desk, and I cried. Because I didn't know if it was going to be OK. It wasn't just me and my friends anymore at this point. Now we had employees, and we supported entire families. And I was feeling overwhelmed with the pressure to make sure that everybody was being taken care of. 
and I was feeling so inadequate as the company's leader. So I did something that probably no other CEOs really do. When nobody was looking, I googled CEO. I wanted to see if I was living up to what real CEOs were doing every day. One of the things it said was advocating for the organization in business and political arenas. Essentially, networking and lobbying, which I was doing neither of which. The majority of the biodiesel industry is located in the Midwest, in farm country. We're talking 50 million gallon a year biodiesel plants made with soybean oil. For perspective, our company makes 3 million gallons of biodiesel exclusively from French fry oil. So I never really thought that I was going to be accepted into that club. But I had a gut feeling, and I was desperate. So I scrounged up the funds, and I bought a ticket to Washington, D.C. to attend the meeting of the National Biodiesel Board, our industry's trade organization. I walked into this fancy cosmopolitan hotel in downtown DC and it was like a record was scratched. The entire room was men, like 150 men. Farmers, lobbyists, men in suits, probably real CEOs who didn't have to Google themselves. And I felt like they were all looking at me. I felt about this big. But as I'd been doing for many years before, I faked it till I made it, and I walked in, and I talked to everybody, and I said, yes, hi, my name's Jennifer, and yes, business is doing great. I totally lied. <laughs> the whole reason I had gone there was because I was trying to connect to somebody in my industry, somebody who understood what I was going through. But when it came right down to it, I completely lacked the courage to tell anybody that I was scared for my business. I felt like as the only woman in that room, if I showed any weakness or vulnerability in the room of all of these men, I was somehow breaking the promise I made to myself when I was eight years old that I was going to be strong and independent on my own. So when I left the meeting, I was feeling dejected and very, very much alone. I made my way down to the subway to get a train to the airport, and it was dark and it was loud, and I found myself staring helplessly at the interconnecting colored lines of the subway map that supposedly represent directions. But don't judge me because I'm from Southern California. It's not our thing. <laughs> I was lost literally because I didn't know what train to get on. But figuratively, I was lost as well. How was I going to make it in this industry? How was I going to make it in life if I didn't have the courage to be myself? And I had an epiphany. It was time for me to let my guard down. It was time for me to stop acting like I had something to prove. On the verge of tears, I finally asked the kind-looking man next to me if he could help me. And get this, he happened to be one of the board of directors from the National Biodiesel Board, the industry trade group that I had just attended. This man helped me navigate the subway, and then he became my mentor. He believed in me when I didn't believe in myself. And I got involved with the industry. And since then, I've had the amazing opportunity to represent small, sustainable biodiesel plants all over the country by testifying in Congress and before the EPA. And I made history when I was elected the first female board member in the National Biodiesel Board's history. And I learned another very important lesson. Faking it till you make it can only get you so far in life. At some point, you have to be willing to admit what you don't know. You have to be willing to admit that you need help. 
because otherwise you may miss amazing opportunities to learn and grow. And you may run the risk of being misunderstood like I was back at the law firm because arrogance is really just insecurity in disguise. So whether I am the only woman in a boardroom full of men or whether I'm testifying in Congress on the record, I speak from my heart. I tell my story in all of its perfectly imperfect glory. Because in the end, it's that vulnerability it, that's going to make a connection to that person that you're talking to. The kind of connection that may motivate a legislator to vote in favor of the environment or small business, even though the oil lobby outspends biodiesel by like a gazillion to one. And it's that connection that has allowed me to have the same amazingly supportive assistant for the last three years. <laughs> So here I am. It took me a really long time. I thought that in order to feel successful, I had to be tough as nails and make a ton of money. But what it takes to be truly successful, like truly successful, all I had to do was just be me. The biodiesel industry, well, it's still a roller coaster. We're actually in a really hard time right now again. Our tax credit has lapsed. But as for me, I no longer move my measurement stick for success. I love what I do. And that keeps me on this side of the line, no matter what. And I'm going to tell you one more story. My mom is now suffering with Alzheimer's disease. And as she's been slipping away from me, I've been reflecting a lot on how her story shaped me into the person I am today. For the longest time, I saw that she was so vulnerable during that time of my life, and I made a terrible mistake. I interpreted it as weakness. Although my father was never in my life, I was secretly thanking him for making me this strong and independent person when all along it was my mom who provided me with all of the tools I needed for true success. My mom went out there after my dad left and she worked her way up in education, eventually becoming the community college uh, foundation director. And she made sure that all three of her kids went to college too. She was passionate about education. And she had the courage to show her emotions, be vulnerable. And because of those things, she will be remembered as one of the most loving, kindest, most generous people that anyone has ever met. My mom lived her life firmly planted on this side of the line. So go out there in your life and find your passion and take risks to do it. And don't get so caught up in the financial aspect of success. Don't be afraid to fail once in a while. Failure is definitely an option. And have the courage to be vulnerable. Be yourself. And you too can find yourself on the success side of this line. Thank you.